All righty, everybody. I am so excited, Chris, to have you on the show. I have been looking forward to an opportunity to get to talk to you. So thanks for being on Hey Docs. Oh, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this as well. Yeah. So I know it's, it's going to be hard to believe, but there could be somebody out there that's listening who may not know who you are. <laughs> um, so I am wondering for our audience, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of history. How did you get into orthodontics? How long have you had your practice? And then I definitely want to hear a little bit about the uniqueness to the practice ah. that, that you're in right now. And yeah. do not forget just a little bit about relapse because that, that's a super special part too. Absolutely. Yeah. So just to summarize, I grew up in uh, Marin County, just north of San Francisco. And my dream was to become an orthodontist since I was a kid, but also to play music. I was polarized between <laughs> my two loves. And that's always hard when one thing will allow you to have a family and the other one probably won't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the yes. chance of the other one is also really tough. My, my first career was actually going to be music. I went to school for music. I played in bands. It's a hundred percent what I wanted to do. I didn't think I could go to school that long, even though I really loved orthodontics. And it was just one day and I heard something from a girl I was dating introduced me to Tony Robbins. And it was cliche, but he said something like, you got the same nervous system as everybody else. So what's mm -hmm. the difference between you or Bill Gates or you and Billy Corgan or any kind of rock star that you want. And he said, it's just, it's nothing. It's massive action. And it just, it sat with me and I go, okay. And then I just put my tail between my legs, went back to Chem 101, started from ground zero, <laughs> aced everything I ever took because I was willing to study harder, work harder. I'm not a photographic memory person at all, but I was willing to, to outwork, basically do whatever it takes. And sure. it was just that one thing. And, and I, you probably see that a lot too with your clients, Jill, where you say that one thing and that revolutionizes their their practice. Mm -hmm. And that one thing I heard revolutionized my life. So I just, I went back to 101, studied my butt off, met Morgan in undergrad. Yes. We were dating other people at the time, but we always had a crush on each other. And then the opportunity presented itself when we were in school together where we started dating and then got married our third year of dental school, had a kid right around then. And then after that, got accepted to the University of Minnesota. My dreams came true. I never thought I'd get a chance to be an orthodontist. And wow. I'm blessed every day I get to be an orthodontist. And she always wanted to work with kids. She always wanted to have kids. And so we had a kid. She wanted to go to Pedo. She followed me to Minnesota for two years. I followed her to Tucson for two years. And I would drive up and work at her dad's practice and then work corporate down there. Got an idea of what I liked, what I didn't like. And mm -hmm. as soon as she was done, we bought out the pediatric office next door and have been working together ever since. Oh, what a great story. And to to think that what you said, I think so many clients that I talk to, they really are questioning, what do I do? How do I how do I move forward? And I love that it could be something so simple that really can change the course of where you're going in 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 life. I, I what a great story um there. So let's talk a little bit because you didn't just start out maybe the typical way that that most orthodontists do where you know you start with just a single practice you guys jumped right into a dual specialty i would love that if you could just take me back to those early days and talk to us a little bit about when you guys were looking at that and deciding to to do a dual specialty what were you what were you thinking about and what was going through your younger minds as you guys were pulling that together and thinking about how this was going to be the course of your orthodontic and her pediatric journey? Sure. We both have always loved kids for her initially loving orthodontics, growing up with her dad being an orthodontist and having a lot of experience working with both orthodontics and kids dentistry. We learned a lot from him. So I, I'd say having a mentor is huge. Mm -hmm. Having someone who's done it. Other pedo ortho couples, there's some in, in all the, the study groups too that have done pedo orthos. Reach out to those people, talk to them. What did they do? But the big thing for us was just learning about early intervention, learning about seeing kids at seven, letting mom and dad know most of the time we're actually not going to treat you. Mm -hmm. But there's probably, there's 10 indications that we, we lecture about all the time when we go around to other offices and teaching them what to look for, mm -hmm. that we, if we miss the boat, it, it completely changes the future of this child's mouth and their face. But most of the time it's, Hey, you don't need anything. And they go, Oh, that's amazing. So you just want to see me every nine months and don't charge anything and take these free x-rays. This is amazing. Like, why doesn't everyone do this? And so we're really trying to get out the message that we want to see everyone at seven because it's so important. Number one, to establish the relationship. And then number two, to screen for those potential early intervention things that we really need to get a hold of before it's too late. 
Yeah. So when you were setting up your systems, and this is something I work with my doctors a lot when we are doing a dual specialty, you really have to think about from design of office to the systems that you're going to have in place, because even though you're in one physical space, you do have two businesses running independently Correct. within it. And the systems, I work a lot with doctors on, okay, how do we have this really beautiful transition from the pedo to the ortho side and, yes. and maybe back to the back onto the pedo side, or when you're designing an office, you really have to put a lot of thought, I believe, into shared or non-shared space yes. and how do these two teams work independently, but yet still in tandem with each other within the space. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could maybe give us some insight on this because you're living it firsthand. When you, let's go all the way back to the beginning, when you guys decided to plot out that, that practice and how you guys were going to work, did you do some shared space? Did you, did you put some thought into, all right, what's good? Are we going to have a pedo side and an ortho side? Or are we going to try yeah. and all work together? Can you talk to that a little bit for us? We, I always wanted, I love treating adults as well. So I mm -hmm. always wanted to have a separate ortho space because I think if you cobra brand as a pedo ortho, and there's nothing wrong with that, you tend to see only kids. Mm -hmm. If you have the orthodontic side separate, you will see those kids anyway, but then you usually see their parents and their parents' friends for Invisalign. And, and that makes up 20, 25% of our practice, even though pedo is the primary referral. In terms of a shared space, we share a door and we have a pano in between. So it's very nice to be able to walk over to the pedo side, say, hey, I've got this patient. They're ready to start. I can see visible caries, or I can see we log into their software and we look and see when their last dental checkup was. And if it's been more than six months, we say, we need to get you over there. We need to make sure that everything is okay before we move forward. And conversely, it's really helpful on her side if she has an orthodontic question where this tooth has gross caries. I'm thinking about restoring it with a, a pulp and crown, but would you extract it for orthodontic purposes? Mm. So a lot of times the parents will come over, we'll take a look, and if we can extract it to help guide in the canines, we do that. And they're always thrilled because they don't want to go through a root canal and crown as a kid. They, and you could just have it out and, and go play soccer the same night. It's just great. And initially we were a little bit worried, to be honest, Jill, about the husband-wife thing and referring mm. as, oh, are you just scratching your wife's back? But we have never had that come up ever. It's more of, we love that that's your wife. We you probably talk about our case at home over dinner. Yes. That's what we want. So I would say any husband, wife couples that are thinking about going in together, I say, do it. And I say, market that. Do not be afraid to refer to your wife or husband thinking that you're handing each other business because you're doing what's best for the child. Mm -hmm. And when you're referring based on what you do on your own child, then they will see that and they will feel that and they will respect and love you for it. Yeah. And I really love what you said there in just having this really, oh, just a really good flow back and forth where the patient, and, and I think that it's so key where the patient feels like, okay, they're really taking complete care of me. Cause that's really what you're yes. doing in a dual practice. It is complete care. If there is a concern on the pedo side, you're right there. You can pop yep. over if you need to, or if there's concern on the ortho side, she's right there. She can pop over if she needs to. And I, I, I just love thinking about that, that big picture. And I know when I'm working with docs and when we're setting this up, I love you said that you guys said you've got a door and a pano. I've seen it where it's a door and a pano and maybe a shared x-ray room or, or I'm sorry, sterilization room where you've got pedo on one side of steri and ortho on the other side or a shared break room or different things like that. So yeah. I, I, what I would put out to the audience that's listening is the beauty of doing dual specialties is first you have to have your vision, right? Of how do we want to work together? And I appreciate that you knew from the beginning that you were also going to want to treat adults because if you didn't think about that in the beginning, that could make it very difficult when you're trying to be out there marketing for adults and they're coming in and to the I'm just going to use this as a funny example to the spaceship office. And they're like, am I in the right place? <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> okay, I like so, you, but I just don't think I can sit in that little chair and yeah, it, look at spaceships all day. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think, so I think that is, um, that's great that, that you thought about it ahead of time. And that's something that I would, I'm sure you would echo this too. I would suggest that you really 
if it's a doctor that's listening or doctors that are listening, that they are really thinking about what do I want out of this? I, I want the beauty maybe of the combined dual specialty, but I also need to have some individualism within these practices. And that kind of leads me into you guys chose to market together, but do you also, and have you also worked on marketing independently too, just to make sure that you are getting the clientele that you're also looking for as well? Absolutely. I think most dentists have wanted to work with us because of Morgan. They know that at some point those kids are going to graduate and need a dentist. Mm -hmm. Whereas they've got 10 other orthodontists knocking on their door. They don't not interested in meeting me very much, but they love meeting Morgan and they love that she can get the dentist out of a tricky spot. And so we always try to say that if you've got a case where you've got a kid that's difficult to treat and you need sedation and you need nitrous and you need all the things that we offer to you, we will take care of that patient and we will not absorb them into our practice. We will absolutely send them back to you and encourage they see you for every six months for your checkups. So I really try to encourage that, that we really want to work as a, a trifecta, I call it. And I like mm. the idea of it, it. It comes back to you. Where a lot of orthodontists that go out, there's not a whole lot we can give back. Yes, we occasionally will see a patient that hasn't seen a dentist in over six months and they need a good dental home and they get a few referrals from that. But it's definitely one-sided where the orthodontist gets a lot more value from the referrals from the dentist. So I think having us market together, which we do, has been a real positive. Now, obviously, if you're going into a pediatric dentist office, you should go independently. <laughs> and <laughs> some of them don't even know we're connected. You know, they're just, hey, I want to be able to help you. Let me show you about early intervention. I don't, I don't mention Morgan really at all because mm -hmm. they might look at that as, as competition, which I mean, who wouldn't, right? But if it's a general dentist, we like to go together and offer that it's really a, a two-way street here. Mm -hmm. But really, if you want to work with us, we want you to work with us because you think we're great providers. But in addition, you will see referrals from our practice when we work together. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about how you guys have, and if you share teams, because this comes up a lot. I know when I'm coaching and working with doctors and team members on both sides, do we run separate teams? Do we have some teams that can switch between sides? How have you guys found it works best? And do you have some suggestions for doctors out there that may be looking at this? Absolutely. It comes to how busy you are too. If you can share staff and you're only open two days ortho, two days pedo, it makes sense to share staff. For us, we don't. We're pretty full on both sides. And so it makes sense to have completely separate teams mm -hmm. that can focus on pedo, can focus on ortho. Um, but we do have our, our billing is uh, on the ortho side is so good. She's so talented. She worked for a, a big group that had multiple practices. She'll go in on Fridays and help the billing on the kids are cool side because she's experienced. So I think it comes down to your team. Who do you yes. have? What are they capable of? Do they want to work pedo? Some people are like, I, I don't want to assist in pedo. It's not my thing. And others mm -hmm. say the same about ortho. I, I changed one arch wire and when we were short, I had someone come over and they're like, I, I don't like this. So <laughs> I, I think... We, I've, been, I've learned over the years to really lean into your team's strengths, to trust your team, to let your team be the voice of your practice as well. It's not you running the show. It's you, you're a co-professional with your team. You're not the boss and they're working for you. It, you. You're really a team. And I think when you adopt that mindset of listening to them and what they really want, they're going to be more likely in the right seats in your mm -hmm. practice. Instead of saying, hey, I need you in marketing. Hey, are, are you a good marketer though? Are you the right person in the right seat? Do you love to market? Then, then that's what I want you to do. So for us, I'd say separate teams, we have one or two floaters that like both uh, when we need them. Yeah, that's, it's great to hear that because that is also what I suggest many times. Again, when we're small, we got to just, we're starting with one or two employees, right? But right. when you get to the size of practice that each of you have, you really need those dedicated, experienced team members, I believe, on each side, just as you're saying. Now, I am curious how this works with culture within the practice. Do you yeah. have or have you experienced kind of two sides with two different culture? Or how are you guys able to, if not, keep, even though you're two different teams running independently, how yeah. do you keep the overall culture uh, strong? That's a great question. We just had an event last night at Bolero where we took everyone out bowling and gave them Stanley Cups that shared. And we scrambled the teams. I'm like, okay, I know you guys always hang out together and you tend to click together. I said, we're going to actually assign who's bowling with who before you even go to the bowling mm -hmm. alley. So they have a chance to get to know each other. I think mm -hmm. that's really important. It does go both ways though. I think when Morgan does, she's ultra giving. She's always bringing in food. She's always doing in sweet things for the staff. Then our 
my team's, why doesn't Dr. Teeters do that for us? <laughs> <laughs> so I think whatever you do, you got to do it combined, try to make it equal for both sides. Cause they look at it as we want some of that too. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, so for us, shared events is huge. Trying to get the, them together because they refer to us. They want to know when they can go talk to someone. So they want to know their name. They want to know stuff about them. So the shared events is great. I think having separate events is good too. Separate meetings, I think, because the pedo staff does not want to learn about arch wires. They never deal with them. It, they'll exactly. just be on their phones. So I think that the meetings related to the business itself and the functions of the business should be independent, but the events, the culture events that are meant to be team bonding should be together. Oh, such good information, Chris. That's, I know somebody just was like, oh, that was the perfect pearl. I'm, I wrote awesome. that down. And again, to, to what you're saying, they are, you are one brand, but you do have independent teams and making the most out of when you're team building, either with on your own side or as a group. And I think it's interesting just to keep in mind too, as you get busier, you would think that everybody would know everybody, right? You're all under the same roof, but everybody is busy doing their jobs. And that I'd love that you guys take the time to get your teams together to have that social interaction. It's the same thing from just independent orthodontic offices where we need to take the time to get out there and meet the the teams of the of our referring doctors that are out there because we we assume that everybody knows who everybody is and they don't, they just don't. (laughs) Oh, I like that idea, Jill. You just gave me an idea (laughs) to go out with those, with the dentist and involve their team and scramble it with the ortho team rather than just us. That would be a great way to do it, especially if they're interested in the pedo side too. Um, Yeah. Thank you for that. Hey, (laughs) yeah. You'll have to let me know. Let me know how that goes. So if you don't mind, I want to get personal for a minute here. And I'm curious to know, how it goes with you and Morgan working together. I can tell you, I have my husband in my business and people probably ask all the time. I know I get asked it. How do you guys work together? How does that work? (laughs) So I'm curious if you don't mind sharing how it has been. I'm sure there are some days that are tougher than others and some days, but I'm curious to know how you guys have found a good work-life balance and what it has been like to build a business together. Absolutely. Dr. Womack, when I first started working, he was one of the senior docs there with my father-in-law, told me one thing. My wife looked at me once when we were working together and said, I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch. And (laughs) I thought that was pretty funny. So for Morgan and I, we we love spending lunch together, but our offices are separate that we honestly don't see each other that much. And when we do, it's very short, brief, usually about patients. I'm not going to we got a, a, a room full of people. I'm not going to go give her a big smooch or something like that. Maybe mm-hmm. something like cute. Hey, hon, how are you doing? But it's pretty professional. And so at the end of the day, we really enjoy that time together because it felt like we haven't seen each other all day, even though we see each other in passing. Lunch, I'm usually working on Mother Girls Conference or relapse stuff. She usually wants to go home, see the kids. And so once again, we have a little bit of separation there to where it feels like we don't work together, even though we do a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. When you think about this balance that you guys have, has that evolved over the years or did you guys just fall into that naturally, do you think? Uh, The balance within referring with one another and the um, practice balance? Just just with you two starting a business, there's a lot of stress that goes along with that. And then getting to where you're at now. And I, I guess I'm asking this question because- I ha- I know I've got some listeners out there that are in the throes of a brand new practice and the stress yeah. that goes along with it. And then you throw partners working together or best friends working together. Yeah. And I just think that there is a level of stress sometimes. And I oh, guess absolutely. what I'm hoping you can tell somebody out there that may be going through this is there is a light at the end of the tunnel and maybe give a little tip on how you guys oh, sh- maneuvered that from the beginning stages to where you're at now, where things are just really clicking along well. We really got into personality tests and finding out what we're strong at. And I think the key is having each other in the right seats. Morgan absolutely is so good with people and culture. Business freaks her out. She doesn't like to look at spreadsheets. She does not want to know about numbers. Me, I could do that stuff all day long. Mm -hmm. So for me, Morgan could be out socializing for eight hours and have another eight hours in her. For me, I put a lot into that and I'm exhausted. So she does a lot more of the culture stuff. And I do a lot more of the business behind the scenes because she could spend an hour and and just want to quit. So I, I think it's good when you're starting is to find out what each of you number one, likes to do to what you're 
good at, inherently good at, and three, what gives you energy. And so that's great. And I appreciate that you just said that because I feel like sometimes as new business owners and as when we're getting into our practices that we feel like we have to do everything. And especially if you've got a partner that you are both sharing the business responsibility, I love your insight in, and I love that you guys did personality tests in coming up with whose strengths. It's almost like a marriage, right? Yeah. Before you get married, going through marriage counseling, right? <laughs> you get, got the five you know, love kind of, languages yeah. and all that. But I feel like for doctors that are going through this, if you guys can each kind of figure out what your lane will be instead yeah. of feeling like, because most of you guys are type A's already and you got to handle it all. But if you can yeah. find that balance like you did and say, hey, I, I'll do the heavy lifting on the business back inside of it. Yeah. You do the heavy lifting on maybe some of the PR component and the marketing component. And I love that you guys were able to figure that out. But I also hope that the listeners, anybody who's listening out there that may be struggling with this is could also hear this and take this too. If you can just, sometimes we feel like we have to run, really move forward. And if we can just slow down, take the time to find out about each other, especially if you're not married, figure out each other's strengths, and then figure out how you guys will tackle this dual specialty practice moving forward. Your living example of it can work. (laughs) For sure. I think another big thing that really helped us, Joe, was bringing on an office manager to handle all of the PR stuff. Mm. That was really hard for Morgan. She wants everyone to love her, want to work for her. And if she has a staff member that's upset with her or patients is upset with her, it'll ruin her. It'll ruin her weekend. And I found that by having an intermediary person to to handle those things allows her to focus on what she can do best, which is patient interaction and being the best doctor she can be. So bringing someone on, even if you have a shared space and that manager works two days in yours or does Mm-hmm. both, which is what we do. I say, Hey, Gretchen, I need you to handle this because I, they know it comes from me, but it's very different if I say it or if she says it. Yeah. If I say it, it could affect our relationship. If the manager says it, it's, Oh, it's coming from management. So mm-hmm. I think it's important to have a barrier for some of the tough stuff, at least for us personally, so that my relationship with the staff is very warm and fuzzy. I, I don't know. Not everyone agrees with that, but I found that me trying to be more Gestapo and just getting on them about every little thing did not work for me. It yep. does not work at all, especially with the new generation. They, they want to love you. They want to respect you and have someone else deliver the bad news. Even if they know it's coming from you, you'll never hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Great insight there. So as any, any thoughts or ideas on, as you and Morgan have been working together and again, you've just been dropping little pearls this whole time, but if somebody wanted to do, or is starting to do a multi-specialty practice, if you were to look back and say, okay, here's what we did to here's where we're at now. Mm -hmm. Are there some key components that you would give some top advice or like definitely be thinking about these three things now that you've got the experience in it? I think number one is the patient experience trumps everything and the staff experience. So probably be my two highest priorities because if the patient comes in and you're starting, you have a lot more time to take that time with them. What I loved a lot when I visited Cole Johnson's office, and I know you worked with him, is he refused to put his office outside the clinic because he was, as an introvert, he he needs to come Mm -hmm. in and and collect his thoughts. He would immediately retreat to his office. So he found that if I have no other option, I have to be out there. And if it's going to happen, it has to be out there. And so when you're starting, take that hour. If you got an hour, Sit down with the kid, get to know the family. If they're willing to stay, obviously, if they're a, you know, a D personality on the disc profile where they just want in and out, you, just, you get them in and out. But most mm-hmm. people, they want to establish a relationship with you. And then when they get to know you, they look you up or learn about your family and, oh, your husband's an orthodontist. I got a daughter who's 16 and she never had braces, so we're going to come see you. So take that time and spend it with the patient. That's going to be more valuable, I think, than most anything you can do. Yeah, that's that is good advice again. And yes, I worked with Cole and it's it again, it's I think each doctor understanding what each it's okay to have different personality traits and to lean in or to even compensate for where you might not feel as strong. Or I love what you said using Cole as an example of knowing that 
if I put myself out there, I just have to be out there. <laughs> exactly. If you don't have an option to retreat. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. So as, as we wrap up here, the one thing that I do want to talk about, I'm going to just take you down a side road for a minute is I want to know, and I want you to tell me about pearls and I know, and just how that came about and how, why you have chosen to pour so much into that. Because I do think that Mother of Pearls has become a staple conference for us. And I appreciate what you and the team has done with that. But I'm I'm curious, you didn't start off doing that. Of course, you had to get your business going and you had to make room to be able to give back. And I think that's what it is all about is giving back to our orthodontic community. But do you mind just speaking to that as we wrap up? I know I wanted to get into the dual specialty component, but I do want to talk just a little bit about that and what that vision was and when, why you have been doing it for so long now. Absolutely. Well, we started with Brian Anderson and I, we were co-residents and we would go on these trips when we had a chance with our classmates and we'd be talking about orthodontics the whole time. And they're like, we're on vacation. What are you doing? We're like, we just love orthodontics. We want to share it with the world. We want to learn a lot. And then when Facebook groups are really becoming a thing, we started orthodontic pearls. And it's actually like, 2014 before it was even a thing it was just really for us it was for university of minnesota grads to chat about but then when this other big group that everyone was a part of imploded over some issues everyone flocked to orthopreneurs for business and ortho pearls for clinical advice and so we became the go-to place for sharing cases for going over challenges and of course there's overlap of business and and clinical in <laughs> both we have been the a real strong clinical focus. So that's been really the go-to place. We got over almost 9,000 orthodontists in that group now, every single one of them. And this takes a ton of time. We've, we vet and verify them. We make sure, are you an orthodontist? You got to send proof. I need your graduation certificate or that you're in residency. And so each person we, we know is an orthodontist. We don't have vendors in our group particularly just so they can feel like they can talk about whatever. Yep. But our chance where they can learn about consulting, like what you offer and new products is we wanted to have a meeting where we could get together in person and take make it, a, we call it a pearls in person experience because we got 9,000 of us chatting and becoming friends, but where's the chance where we can actually get together, have a great time and learn a lot and also be aware of products and services that can help grow our practice. So that started in 2018 when John Pham gave us a, a place and you were there. Yes, that I was. was. Really a great it day. was awesome. Yes. And I remember we're like, but we need some entertainment. And Cole and I and Kyle happened to be chatting and we say, hey, we play instruments. And we got together and started rehearsing virtually. He said, hey, let's just try this thing. And I, we ended up going into John Pham's headquarters in this little room where all the storage boxes were, where we're setting <laughs> up our equipment. And he said, John was looking at us like, what is going on? I'm paying for this meeting to help give you a space. And here you are with these like drums going into this corporate office. What what are we doing? And so we actually had never met in person. We all met that weekend. We had talked, but we never actually physically got together. Oh my Um, gosh. I did not know that. I thought that you guys had met ahead of time. Yeah. But what was cool about it is when I played for the worship team at a local church, I learned about how we can rehearse virtually, how we Mm -hmm. can have a version of our songs without each other's parts. And so we went up there and we played the song for 200 people in a little dive restaurant. And we played just seven songs. And at the end of it, there was a chanting for an encore. And I've never had that in my life. I'm like, I would make it if someone just had, we're like, we don't have any more songs. We're out of things to do, but people are just absolutely loving it. And then six months later, we're playing for 800 people. And then now we we played the Invisalign Summit for 6,500 orthodontists and we headlined the AEO for 6,500 more. And um, it's, it's become this weird niche. And I think that also speaks to our practices. We got to think about what's our niche, right? If we're the mm-hmm. world's only all orthodontist band in the ortho space, we have a huge following. But if we go to a dive bar, there's going to be nobody there. Nobody knows who Relapse is. But in this unique space, we happen to be the only one. And so we, we luckily have drawn a following that has had an encore ever since. And we're really excited to integrate that. So, so we played at every Mother of Pearls. That, that's always been the tradition is have a, a Pearls party with Relapse playing. So you get great content, get to learn about great yes. product services. And then we have a heck, heck of a party. So yes, 20- always my favorite part. <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Relapse groupie. So I, love, awesome. I love, love, love it. So that's great. And it's fun to hear that story. And I know a lot of the listeners are like, oh, that's how it that's how it came to be. So that's great. And with Mother of Pearls, I again I just want to say I really appreciate that you guys have really taken it upon yourselves to put on 
good conferences with good content. And I know that is your goal is to just number one, make sure we've got good content out there. And then it's like the mullet business on the front side, party in the back, right? <laughs> 100%. <laughs> it's got to be a good time. And we found that going to conferences that people, they get a lot of CE information, but a lot of people go just to hang out with their colleagues, the social CE as we call it. You can't mm -hmm. beat that being one-on-one -on -one with each other, getting to know each other. And then that's where the pros also happen afterwards is they go back to the group. So they said, Hey, I visited Jill's booth. What do you think of you user? Oh, she's great. And then people talk about it. And so it goes yes. beyond that. And then people have a chance to really find out organically what's worked in their practice. And so it, it's really great for everyone all around. And it's hopefully something we can continue to do for a long yeah, time. Yeah, that's great. Chris, as we uh, wrap up here, I would love it if you wouldn't mind just letting people in the event that somebody doesn't know how to find out about pearls or they want to know where relapse is going to be. But also if you would be open to have somebody reach out to you, if they've got a question about doing a multi-specialty practice or they're just looking for just somebody to ask some questions to, how could they get a hold of you and find out more? You can reach me anytime. I'm on Facebook under my name, Chris Teeters. Just look me up, send me a message. You can also call me 415-608-6148, text me, totally fine. You can email me, christeeters at gmail.com. If you want to learn more about the Orthodontic Pearls Group, you can join on Facebook. It's free to any orthodontist, so you can share and we can chat there. Or you can even go to the search bar and type in orthopedo. And anyone, any conversation that's ever been about orthopedo, it will show up there. So you can get a lot of ideas there. And then lastly, at orthodonticpearls.org is where you can go learn about where Relapse is playing, learn about the Mother Pearls Conference, where you can hear Jill and others speak about things that will help improve your practice. Awesome. It has been just a joy having you on the show. And I really appreciate you taking time to just give my audience a little insight into what it's like to be an orthodontist, but to be an orthodontist of a dual specialty practice. I know it means a lot. My absolute pleasure. I'm happy to help any way I can. Yeah, great. If I, if you are okay, I like to finish up the show with a little quick speed round. Are you <laughs> interested in the speed round challenge? Absolutely. Let's do it. Uh, Bring it on. All right. Describe your style. One word. Ooh, energetic. Ooh, I like that one. What are you listening to or watching? I'm reading and listening to Outlive by Peter Atia. It's an amazing <laughs> book. Such it's a good changed book. Changed my life. Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah, it's so I, good. I am right now going through it. My husband and I both are. Such a good book. Awesome. And I do, I read and audible. So I do, I just depends on where my brain is at. So Perfect. such, such a good book. What do you do just for you? I would say play guitar and lift weights. Nice. All righty. Any hidden talents? Hidden talents. I could play most of the big instruments, piano, guitar, drums, vocals, a little bit of everything. Wow. Wow. My goal was to learn piano before I'm uh, 55 and that is getting really <laughs> close tough. and it's not even close to happening. The age is going to get there quicker before I get the piano <laughs> learned. <laughs> and then if sure. you had one big, hairy, audacious goal, what would that be? Oh boy. I want to, I'm turning 40. I want to make sure 40 is the new 30. So I took on based on Dr. Jacob Koch's advice. He, I got with a trainer. He did like a bodybuilding competition. I know it's silly. I'm not trying to win anything, but I want to see if I can feel 30 when I'm 40. And that's a Peter Atia thing. He says, prevention's everything. The number one thing you can do is physical fitness. So docs, don't forget that. Don't neglect yourself. Take time for you. You'll be a better husband, better orthodontist if you take that time for exercise. And that in that book, to summarize it, he said that is the number one thing you can do yeah. to stave off the four things that get rid that take most of us out. Like you, you've got to exercise. You have to. So make that time for you. And that's my big goal is to just get in the best shape of my life. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. All right. We are going to wrap it up here again. Thank you so much for being on Hey Docs. I really appreciate it. And I hope to have you on uh, again. Uh, anytime. Thanks, Thanks Jilly. Appreciate mm -hmm. it.